Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of my lovely wife, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Greetings. Greetings. Hallelujah. We're so blessed that you can join us for this time in the Word as we continue on in our study of Paul's second letter to Timothy. We're in the third chapter, and uh, we're right near the end of the third chapter. We're going to start at verse 15, 2 Timothy 3.15. And we're going to do that. By the way, uh, let, me, let me say this. All of this study is available online as we go ahead and do it, and we'll, it'll stay online at www.bibletalk.com. So, and you can write to us if you have any comments or questions or suggestions at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, we would. Yes, we would. <laughs> so we're going to start right after Alice asks for the Lord's blessing on our time together today. Father, we just come before you with praise and thanksgiving for all that you do and have done for us and for your precious son, yes. Jesus. Father, we thank you for the word that we're going to be studying tonight and for the understanding that you're going to give us. Amen. We love you, Lord, and we ask that we use what we learn and share it with others. Amen. Amen. All righty then, as I said, we're in 2 Timothy verse, chapter 3, verse 15. And Paul is talking to Timothy, and he says, And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He said, from childhood you have known the sacred things. Remember, he had written earlier in this letter, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the first chapter, in verse 5, he had said, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. You know, that's surely what uh, is being referred to by Luke in the book of Acts, in the 16th chapter, verse 1, when Paul came to Derby. And Lystra, and he said, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Say Acts 16, 1. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's that first place. Oh, how glorious it is for a child to be brought up in the way he should go, as Timothy was, right? He was he, trained up. He was trained up by his grandmother and his mother. Mm -hmm. uh, too bad his father wasn't there, but who knows what happened, right? doesn't tell us. And how shameful it is that that is so rare now, so rare today. And it, it should be, it should be so common for children of believers to be brought up in the ways they should go in the Word of God, mm -hmm. right? I mean, think of the foremost command, and it is the yes, foremost. A man yes. came to Jesus and said, tell me, what's the foremost command? And Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy 6, mm -hmm. verses 6 and 7. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In other words, you're supposed to be teaching this, and this is primarily directed to the fathers, by the way. Be directed so that they're hearing the word of God being brought up in the word of God from, from the earliest times. In everything. In, every, in everything. Mm -hmm. Because as Peter said, the Word of God is not just about religious stuff. No, it's life. It, it, it's everything pertaining to life and godliness, okay? So that's so much better than sending children off to government schools to be trained in the ways of the world. After all, it says here that these sacred writings, the Word of God, lead to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I mean, I know so many Christian parents. You're wondering, well, why did my parents, did you bring them up in the Word? Did you? Did you train them in the Word? And not only that, did they see the Word at work in and through your life? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it says by the mouth of two or three witnesses, what comes out of your mouth has to be confirmed by what you walk with your feet, the action that you take. You have to live it. And listen, let me just tell you this. And I know this is true here in the United States. I'm, I'm very intimately aware of that. And I, I know it's also true in the United Kingdom where we minister a lot. Your children are not going to hear the word of the cross, the power of God in a government school. And it's very unlikely they'll hear it in a religious school. 
sad, sad, <laughs> but, sad. But it's true. Peter, I quoted Peter a minute ago, but in 1 Peter 2, 20, verse, chapter 1, verse 23, he wrote, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. The imperishable seed. What's a seed do? A seed brings forth life, life. Mm -hmm. after its own kind. Isn't that, isn't that right? Absolutely. Well, you better be, you better be uh, once a seed is planted, it has to be cultivated. It has to die. Well, you need to be cultivating the Word of God in your children, mom and dad, dad and mom, all right? All right, so why? Let's move on to the next verse, because this is where I really wanted to spend time. 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture... I'm not reading from the New American Standard, all right? And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All Scripture is inspired by God. Well, the King James says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The English Standard Version, which is another essentially literal translation, uses the phrase, all Scripture is breathed out by God. But in the original Greek here, it says, all Scripture is God-breathed. The Greek word is theonoustos, all right? It's God-breathed. It's the very breath of God. And the importance of this distinction, that it's not just inspired, but it is literally God-breathed. You can't overstate the importance of this. We just read that we're born again by the imperishable seed, and that is the living and enduring Word of God, right? From mm -hmm. Well, like the seed of a plant or fruit, the seed of the Word will bring forth after its own kind. That's what it says in Genesis 1, right? Right. Then the Lord formed man of the dust of the earth, of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Genesis 2, 7. God's breath is what put life into Adam. He'd been formed. Mm -hmm. He's laying there, man, all right? Right, right? But there was no life in man until God breathed life into him. And you know what? You and I were dead walking in our, in our trespasses, our sins. That's what it says in Ephesians 2.1. The walking day that you see on television is such a big deal. You know what? That's an inkling of truth. Yes. Because if you don't have a relationship with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ, you are dead. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter the fact that you're walking. You are dead. You're dead in your trespasses. You're dead in your sins. And it says in Ephesians 2, 17 and 18, that he, talking about Jesus the Word, mm -hmm. came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. We have our access through the word of God, through Jesus. He breathed life into us through the living and enduring word of God. That's what it said in 1 Peter right, one twenty three. That's the only thing that can give you life. All right? If, if you don't have a right relationship with the Father through the atoning word, you're dead. Sin separates you from God. That's what it says in Isaiah. Because one of the things that people don't, I think, really believe or maybe think about is that we are spirits. Your spirit is either alive or it's dead. Or it's dead. Absolutely. We are spiritual beings, yes. right? And you need to be alive spiritually. Absolutely. And that only comes from one way. All right? So, but let me go back to the start of that verse again. Mm -hmm. All Scripture. Now, the Greek word that's used here for all <laughs> is used more than, 12, more than 1,200 times in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And it literally means all. <laughs> <laughs> all scriptures. And the scriptures that were common to, to the believers that Paul was writing to were the scriptures in the Old Testament. The sacred writings. The sacred writings. Scripture is Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Mm -hmm. Now you got to get that, because here's something I want to know, and I've I've talked about this for over for forty years. 
Around the year uh, 144 AD, there was a man named Marcion, he, uh, and he was responsible for spreading one of the most significant heresies in the early church. He had rejected the Hebrew Bible and the God of Israel mm -hmm. and the Old Testament in, in every sense because he said that the God of the Old Testament is not the same God of Jesus and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he couldn't understand or he could not comprehend, he could not accept a God of judgment. Yes. But God is a just God. Yes, he is. He is a God of amazing grace, but he's also a God of justice. And he is a God who said, you know, the wages of sin are death. Death is required. It's always been required according to the word of God. Well, death was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, if you receive that. So now this Marcion, he was excommunicated by his own father, who was the bishop of Sinope, and he was denounced as a heretic. And yet I am pained to see how much of the same attitude still exists in the spirit-filled Bible-believing church of today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You start talking about judgment. God brings. You know what? I, if, if you don't, if you don't believe that God today can still bring judgment, then you don't believe all Scripture is God breathed. You don't believe all Scriptures, and you don't know God, and you don't know God, and you don't know the Word, right. or you reject the Word that you don't like, and that's what's too, all too common. And that's the choice that we don't have. We can't pick and choose. You may not the Word of God. You may not. Oh, you, you know what? You're going to be judged by the word. Yeah. Okay. In practical terms, when faced with a judgment of an, a righteous God, many Christians who in all ways accept the Old Testament promises that they like will reject the truth of the rest of it, the judgment. Okay. Those selective believers also reject so much of Scripture indiscriminately without giving any thought to the fact that the Apostle Paul who more than any other taught on faith rather than works. And by the way, quotes the Old Testament over and over and over and over in his writings, is now proclaim, proclaiming all scripture is God read. Amen. All scripture. Yes, that does mean Deuteronomy. It does mean Leviticus. It does mean Genesis. That does mean Exodus. All of it. That is God breathed and it's profitable, right? So bear with me a minute. Remember, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to read from Matthew 5, starting at verse 17. He said, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass on the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that, my brother and sister, is revelation from God. That's right. Now, what we need, we have revelation. Mm -hmm. now, we now what we need, as Solomon said, acquire wisdom, acquire understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Proverbs 4, 5. You've got, we've been given revelation. I mean, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is all what God has revealed to us. What we need is understanding of what he has revealed. All right? Mm -hmm. We have to understand, like Paul did, that the God who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. So it's not, you know, listen, you got, what, what, you know, Paul also wrote that we have to appraise, the spiritual man appraises all things spiritually. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn to appraise this thing spiritually. But the word has not been canceled out. The word has not been overridden, okay? The word is still the word. It is still the God-breathed, life-giving word of God, all right? The Old Testament, like I said, so many people are discounting or discrediting the Old Testament in practice. The Old Testament scriptures do not 
contradict nor compete against the writings of the new at all. Consider this, these statements of Jesus, all right? Mm -hmm. When Jesus was walking down on the road to Emmaus and, and with the two fellows, remember this account in mm -hmm. Acts, right? Or, yeah. uh, in Luke, rather. And so he meets these fellows on the road going to Amos, and he says to him, says to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Mm -hmm. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Luke 24, verses 25, 26, and 27. Hmm. So he's saying, when he talks about Moses, he's talking about the, Pen the, uh, the Torah, the Pentateuch, right. the, the, the first five books of the Bible. The so what he is saying is that the things concern him, all about him, can be found in Genesis in Exodus, Exodus mm -hmm. in Leviticus, and Numbers, and De Deuteronomy. He is the Word. He is. He is there. The, uh, every place in Scripture, it testifies to the coming and the work of Jesus Christ. They had not believed all that the prophets had spoken. That's why they were in a quandary. Right. Jews were persecuting Jesus for not keeping the law, the Sabbath. Something that they, who so, so expert at scripture and being and religious, did not understand at all. So he said to them, Jesus said to them, You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. John 5, 39 and 40. It's the scriptures that testify about Jesus. All the scriptures. All the scriptures. Remember, the context of this is when he's talking to, you know, the Jews, when he's talking to the Pharisees, when he's talking to the scribes, and all, their, their concept of Scripture is what we call the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And yet Jesus is saying, you don't understand it because it all testifies of me. It's his story. All scripture, amen, all Scripture is the life-giving breath of God. Even God. the parts you life. don't like. Mm -hmm. Even the parts you don't like. What's your favorite verse? You have a favorite verse? Why do you have a favorite verse? Well, why do you have a favorite verse? Every single one of them is God breathed. Now, I, I understand that, you know, what happens is there are scripture verses that have greater impact in our life when God speaks them to us in a timely fashion, right? But every scripture is the breath of God that pours life into you. What part of scripture have you never read? Now be honest, be honest. I mean, I listen, Alice and I have been blessed for the last more than four decades. I mean, we have traveled, we have traveled around the world. I have shared with people in probably 25 different denominations, I think. I know lots of Christians and I can talk to them about this part of, you know, and, and they, they've never read it, they've never heard of it. Because they they don't read those parts of scripture, like numbers. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to tell you something. Every part is important. I'm no I'm no different. I mean, I'm I am a, a, a human being like your own very self. <laughs> and I mean, there are things you know you pick up and you read something in numbers or you know one of my favorites is in, in Nehemiah where it gives the Nehemiah in the third chapter with the list over and over and over all the people that are working Pairing, on the wall just yeah, blah blah blah. You know, it's this person and that person. But I sat down one day and I was reading it. And I have read, yes, I have read all through all of the scripture. And it, I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks. There was something so exciting in there. Because there was a revelation of one person, mm -hmm. Baruch. Baruch. Yeah. One person who God notes among all the others who is doing the work like everybody else. But he was doing it with a zeal. Diligently? Or was it no, it was zealously. Zealously, right? zealously yes. Yeah, zealously. Because God not, not only looks at what you're doing, he looks at how you're doing it, right? But he's watching. When Jesus said to his disciples, and many of them, many of his disciples were complaining, they were griping, because his word was too difficult, right? Yes. And Jesus said, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. 
The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. John 6, 63. God breathed life into Adam, right? How long can you hold your breath? Never timed it. <laughs> well, I, and you can testify to this. Yeah, Back in the day can. before my accident, uh, I, I could stay underwater, and I spent a lot of time swimming, a lot of time. Yes. And I could stay underwater long enough to make virtually everybody around nervous. Very nervous. Make them nervous. <laughs> I mean, I used to be able to hold my breath for, for, a very long. for a very, very long time. And by the way, when Alice and I were living in Miami, we had a, a, an office neighbor who was one of the, oh, right. who was a championship free diver. Yeah. And I mean, he could, this guy, I mean, it's incredible how these yeah. free divers, how, they, how long they can hold their breath. But you know what? At some point, you got to take another breath. That's right. <laughs> how long can you hold your breath? Well, how long can you go without the Word of God? Mm. Because when you're doing that, if you're not abiding in the Word, you're not getting that breath of God that, right. into your life that you need to sustain you. And yes, you need it, all right? Well, just made, you made me think when you said before you have a favorite scripture, or if there's a scripture that you know, just jumps out at you, and I think that's when God breathes it into you, because if you're reading something, and then you go, oh, and that's yeah. like that, you t that intake of air, that's his breath, yeah. making that yeah. alive, that, that scripture was alive. I like alive. that, I like that. <laughs> the, the point is, I mean, and I know that God can use a verse and quicken it to you yeah. because it is a need of your life at, at that, that moment, moment in time. Yes. Yeah. But by the way, every other verse is still the power of God, yes. right? So it's profitable for teaching. The King James says doctrine. Well, teaching. Hosea, the prophet Hosea in Hosea 4, 6 said this. My people, this is God speaking through him, right? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being my priest. So many Christians I've met seem to know more about their favorite entertainers or athletes than they do about their God, their Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And certainly more than they know about the Word. And then perhaps they do not have, as we've talked about, they, if they don't know the word, they're not going to walk in the triumph of Christ Jesus. And that should be part of what we desire to do. We want to walk, if, if not for just our benefit, for his glory. Isaiah said, therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. If you don't recognize the fact that your lack of knowledge, any, you know, if you're not gaining and growing in knowledge of the Lord, his word, the Lord who is the word of God. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to be taken captive somewhere along in, in, in things in your life, all right? If you don't know, right, if you like knowledge, if you don't know, it's because you've rejected knowledge. If you cannot take the time to know because you're too busy being a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God, as Paul talked about earlier in this chapter, mm -hmm. then you've rejected knowledge. It says early in this letter to Timothy that we must, and I'm, I'm reading 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15, 2, 15 right now, mm -hmm. be diligent. The King James says, study to show yourself approved unto God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to be diligent. You've got to study. With the tools that are available today, it, that's never been easier. I mean, I mean that's really... You can, you can have not only your own bi your Bible, but multiple translations of the Bible for comparison along with Hebrew and Greek right in your telephone, even your smartphone, and be carrying it around, or your, your tablet. I mean, it's never been easier to study the Word. And study it, you should study it, you must. Do you use them? Do you have a smartphone? Do you have a, an iPad or a, a tablet? You have a Bible there, program? There are some great, great Bible programs, mm -hmm. software out there, all right? Are you diligent? Do you really study the Word? Or do you wait for your pastor to diligently study the Word and then deliver mm -hmm. a prepackaged little, you know, fast food teaching to you in a few minutes each week? Jesus said that your Heavenly Father 
feeds the birds of the sky. Yes. Right? Yes, he does. Hallelujah. The birds of the sky, those are the ones that are old enough to fly. Yes. What about the little birdies in the nest who can't fly in? Well, their parents, the mama bird and the papa bird, they go out and they gather the food. Yes. And they eat it and they digest it and then they come home and they throw up in the kid's mouth. Well, you know, the reality of being a child, you know, that's, these are harsh things. But you shouldn't be waiting for a pastor to go digest the food and throw it up in your mouth. Yeah. You got to get in. You got to study. You got to be in the Word. You have to abide in the Word. All right. Jesus said, "We're no longer to be children." Well, this is Paul. We're no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice has their senses trained to discern good and evil. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. You have to do this. You have to train your senses. You have to grow up. You have to exercise. You have to practice. You have to train your senses. These are the perilous last days. Don't just read the word once in a while. Abide in the word. Continue in the word. We were just warned a few verses earlier in this letter where Paul wrote to Timothy and said, But evil men and impostors will, will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That was here in 2 Timothy 3.13, right? And Jesus, speaking specifically of the time of his coming and the end of the age, warned, many false prophets will arise and mislead many. So if you've never really heard this before, please hear it now. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Psalm 119, 72. The word of God is profitable. The word of God is profitable for teaching. And yet it is the one thing that most schools, that most Christian parents send their children to, will not and cannot teach. Father, Teach your children. Mother, spend time teaching your children the word of God. When you speak that word of God into them, you are speaking God's breath into them, that life-giving breath that is profitable for all things, everything pertaining to life. to life and godliness. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, which reveals you and your plan, the plan that you have, a plan for life. Lord, help us to, to truly abide in that word, to treasure that word, to treasure it more than great riches. We praise you and thank you that your son Christ Jesus is the word made flesh who dwelt among us. Well, until next week, God bless may you. God bless you and may you be used for the glory of his name. Bye bye till then.